nice it is to see yes how nice it is to to see you uh isam professor mm. shihara and me too and thank you your, a lot your students yes my brother yes so today uh you asked me and i'm happy to speak about civil rights in the united states um so in the uh, little time that I have, I just want to give uh, a broad overview of this history. So this is maybe just for context. The yes. history of the United States uh, started basically in 1607. Yes. When the uh, British came to the colonies so our country is clearly very young. It's only 414 years old. Yeah. And the history of the United States is the history of race, racial difficulty, racism, white supremacy, and racial tension. So here's just two other little numbers. You can see that the institution of slavery, legal slavery, in the United States lasted almost 250 years. Yeah. And that was followed immediately when slavery ended after the American Civil War in 1865. It was followed immediately by almost 90 more years of legal racial segregation yeah so if you look at the 414 years in american history out of the 414 years for 335 of those 414 years of our national existence the law the law has been used to racially dominate, kill, enslave, abuse, or legally live separate from people of color. That's about 82% of American history has been dominated by racial law of white supremacy. So this is, this is not just a part of our history, it's the dominant part of our history. And whatever difficulties you read about in your papers or perhaps see on TV or the internet with the George Floyd killing last year yeah. and other, other incidents of police violence uh, or citizen violence against black people. This is a tragic norm in our country, yeah. uh, I'm sad to say. Yeah. So the modern civil rights movement really is considered to have begun in 1954 yes. with the United States Supreme Court decision of Brown versus the Board of Education, which it up until then, it used to be legal in America. It was called separate but equal, where the two races could live separately, but they were never equal. Uh, not equal in opportunity, not equal in experience. But in 1954, the US Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal was still discriminatory and that had to end. And so it ordered full integration of schools, of public transportation, of, of everything, of life. Uh, most of the segregated facilities in, the, in, the America, in America were in the South, and that's where I was born and where I grew up. I, I grew up in a very small town in 1950. I was born in Alabama, yeah. which yeah. is right, of course, in the middle of all of that disturbing behavior. 
when I was little, it was not legal for me to go to school with people who were black. Uh, I wasn't allowed to go to any building where we could sit together. Uh, if we wanted to see a, a movie in a movie theater, uh, black people were, had by law had to sit in the balcony on top and white people sat on the bottom. Uh, you were not allowed to drink out of the same water fountain uh, when I was born. So 1954, uh, that law changed. Uh, at least it said that the law had to change. And the South, my state and most of the 13 states in the South, resisted that change. They did not want to follow the national law. And it was still, uh, the, law, the law was not followed. We had a terror group. You, you probably are aware of it in today's America. It's still in existence. It started in 1866. It's still around. It's called the, the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. Uh, I'm just writing it down. I'm assuming, well, I'll show you the, the name for your students. This is one of the leading terror groups in the United States today. And they are committed to an America for, for whites only. It's a white supremacist terror organization. And it's been in existence for almost 160 years. Yeah. Um, so starting in 1950, <laughs> 55, uh, one year after the Supreme Court decision, the resistance to uh, the, the civil rights movement began uh, by African Americans, by black people in the American South trying to demand their rights for dignity as equal citizens. Uh, this started um, in Montgomery, Alabama, with perhaps a very famous Montgomery bus boycott of Rosa Parks. She was an African-American woman yeah. uh, that uh, did not give up her seat uh, on a bus. Yes. Uh, so that, that began uh, wait a minute, I've lost the screen here, sorry. Mm -hmm. Laura, can you get the screen back? Can you still hear me? Yeah, 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 I hear you. Okay, uh, just lost the screen, but I'll, I'll keep talking. No. So the, the Montgomery bus boycott began uh, in Alabama in 1954, um, and then starting in the 1960s, uh, at a university in North Carolina, yeah, there you are. At a university in North Carolina, students um, began to demand their right to sit at a public lunch counter. This began what was known as the sit-ins, and I'll write that down. The sit-ins was a nonviolent effort by black students to demand their rights to be served food um, in, in restaurants. Yeah. Those, stud those students were arrested. There was always white resistance to this. Yeah. Uh, in 1961, there was an effort by 13 people, men and women, black and white, who rode two buses from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans in the South, and they were known as Freedom Riders. And their goal was to integrate uh, public bus terminals that allowed both people, both races, to, to sit together on public transportation. Those buses were attacked 
by Klansmen and others, and people were beaten, some were killed, buses were set on fire. It was very violent, yeah. as whites did not want to to do this. And whites in the South, yeah. uh, this this trend of violence uh, on integration was the main theme in the 1960s. So we had uh, uh, attempts by university students, the, the age of your students, who mm -hmm. wanted to become the first black students at the University of Mississippi and the University of Alabama, uh, who, were, who needed federal troops to integrate those universities uh, because the governor of those states said no. But they were forcibly integrated. And perhaps one of the major names is this young man, James Meredith, yeah. who was an African American, the first person, the first black student to be integrated into the University of Mississippi. There were riots, two people were killed, there was violence, it was terrible violence. This continued in 1963, 64. Uh, I'm sure all of your students know about the Reverend Martin Luther King. Yes. Um, who started leading civil rights efforts in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, just about two hours from where I grew up, all over the South, Mississippi, uh, Georgia. Uh, always there was terrible, terrible violence bombings, assassinations, shootings. Uh, these were very dark, violent, and disturbing times in the United States on this issue. Um, this issue was also occurring, this violence, this racial violence was also occurring at the same time that the United States was in the war in Vietnam. So the entire country uh, was violent on numerous issues, anti-war protests and racial violence. Uh, in 1968, uh, on April 4th, Reverend King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee by a white Southerner. Yeah. And it led to multiple race riots uh, throughout the United States. I was a university student uh, in Washington, D.C., just about three blocks from the White House. And I remember that night going up onto the roof of my building, of the dormitory where I lived. It was eight stories high, and you could see people in the streets rioting. There was riots against police. There was shooting. Uh, people were burning buildings. It was uh, incredibly violent and destructive when Reverend King was killed. Yeah. Uh, in 1968, two months after Reverend King was killed, Senator Bobby Kennedy, who was trying to become the new president, yeah. he was assassinated and there was more violence and racial unrest um, in in 1968. Uh, this, this really did, this racial trouble really um, did not end uh, in the 1960s or even the 1970s. These shootings, disturbances uh, kept playing out in the streets of America. The violence, uh, almost weekly violence, on the issue of civil rights um, really went on nonstop from 1954 almost uh, until 1979, uh, almost 25 years of nonstop racial violence. In that time, President Johnson, uh, who became president after President John Kennedy was assassinated here in Dallas in 1963, there were two major positive pieces 
of civil rights legislation that did pass. Yeah. Uh, one of them, <clears throat> one of them was the 1964 Civil Rights Act, yes. uh, at, which helped people in the South, especially poor people and black people. Uh, it, it helped them register to vote. They had been denied this, even though it had been their right to vote. Whites, white males had kept them from voting. But the 1964 and 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, helped many, many people uh, around the United States and especially in the South secure the right to vote. This was, of course, a good thing. Uh, finally, uh, in the late 1970s, uh, Jimmy Carter, a white southerner from Georgia, became president in 1976. And Carter was the first president to really bring human rights uh, and civil rights, but especially human rights, into the White House and made it uh, more of a national policy. And Americans began to be uh, aware for the first time as to what human rights were and what they are. Uh, this is 2021, and the average American still uh, has no understanding of human rights in their own country and certainly not around the world. Yeah. Starting in 1980, pretty much to today, so that's about 40 years. In 1980, Ronald Reagan became president. Yeah. And as a Republican. Yeah. And since 1980, uh, only three Democrats have been president. Yeah. Bill Clinton for eight, two terms, eight years. Uh, Barack Obama yeah. for two eight. terms. Yes. And now Joe Biden. Yeah. But the overwhelming, uh, I guess this is the, the final chapter of this civil rights issue per se, when it's important in America um, as to who is president. Yeah. Because in addition to being president, presidents get to nominate people to the U.S. Supreme Court yeah. and, and to the federal judicial courts. So, of course, all presidents appoint people from their own party. Yeah. And since 1980, uh, the Republicans have been in the White House for the majority of that time. And that ramification for civil rights in America is this. The Republican Party has traditionally been very opposed uh, to granting civil rights to other groups other than white males. They have opposed civil rights. Americans for black people, for gay people. Uh, the Republican Party has steadfastly always wanted white white people and especially white males to be in the majority and making these decisions yeah. so they have been uh, against the expansion of civil rights uh, since 1980 even before then but especially since 1980 and today uh, in in the 50 states uh, now in the United States uh, the Republicans uh, there are governors in most of those states. Uh, they control the courts in most of those states. And they are the majority in the United States Senate. Yeah. So this is to say that in the United States today, especially in states led by Republicans, overwhelmingly white men, some white women, but they're all white, there has been 
a a uh, rollback, a reduction of past civil rights advancements. Yeah. And there are new laws now. I'm sure your students know we have elections in the United States next year. Yeah. And again for the White House in 2024. Uh, mm -hmm. And in more than half the states in the United States today, uh, Republican governors are passing laws, the legislatures are passing laws to restrict the voting rights of people of color yeah. to make it to make it much harder for those people to get access to vote, access to health care, access to their rights. Yeah. So America on the issue of civil rights is really in a crisis. Yeah. Uh, I'll say this and then I'll stop and I'm happy to try and take questions. Many people, especially those who have never been to the United States, have a view of this country, of course. And in many ways, in many ways, this is a very good country to live in. But when it comes to civil rights uh, and human rights, the United States is a very difficult country to live in. Yeah. If you are in this country and you do not care about social justice or civil rights or human dignity for all people, if you don't care about those things, then America is a very easy place to live. But if you do care about social justice and work for human rights and civil rights for all people, regardless of who they are, African Americans, people of color, Muslims, poor people, whoever they are, then this is a very, very difficult country to live in because there is still strong resistance to social justice for all people. There is ongoing violence against those people. Uh, so this, this country has a lot of work to do. It's better than it was, but it's not as good as it needs to be. If, I, if I'm a professor and I had to give a, a grade for America and its commitment to civil rights in 2021, I would give it a grade of C. It's just a mediocre grade. This country has a lot of work to do to improve its civil and human rights records. Um, I'll, I'll try to stop with that and hope that's kind of a broad overview um, and I'll be happy to take whatever questions your students have. And again, I just want to thank you for having me and giving me a chance to see you again and to interact with your students. I, I think you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. I am uh, just happy, you know, to have you and be glad about this insightful and uh, enlightening lecture about the American civil rights and about the status of America today. And yes, as you said, it is going to be a long uh, road for us and for you in order, you know, to ensure human rights, equal human rights and dignity for all people. Now, I just, you know, let my students to ask you questions. Uh, please write, you know, write down in the chat box, any question to Professor Rick Halbrand, come forward. Don't feel shy. I know it is your first time, but you know, it will be the beginning for more lectures in the future more collaboration with Professor Rick Halpern. Any question, Ruba, Ruba Malama? Yeah, I think you wrote something here about uh, 
Klux Klan, domestic terror group founded by Southern whites. Another question, okay, Munira Abu Musa. Thank you for being with us, Professor Rick. And uh, I think Ruba wants to ask you about the resistance uh, against uh, ensuring equality between the blacks and white in America. Uh, any um, comment about that? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, thank you for the question. And uh, let me just say, um, I, I, your English, all of you students, your English is better than my Arabic because my <laughs> Arabic does not exist. Yeah, you know. So, <laughs> the, you know, my, I, your, your, your English is way better than my Arabic. Oh, um, okay. So th this question, this question of resistance, it's, it's political resistance, mm -hmm. uh, especially in our government today uh, by the Republicans, the Democrats, Mr. Biden is pushing for civil rights and the expansion of voting rights, but he is getting a lot of political resistance yeah. in Washington from the Republicans. Uh, and there is sadly still individual acts of violent resistance of killing of black people uh usually by police usually so it's it's a still a very dangerous country for people of color in uh, in the united states today it's tragic but it's it's that's the reality yeah 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 uh just you know rick i want you know to tell the students you know about your program and here i have a question actually okay now, same question about Klux Klan and, uh, you know, white radicals against the black people. Just tell, uh, just tell my students, Rick, about your program, Embry Human Rights Program, and about the great work you are doing for all these years, yeah. Sure, well, thank you. No. Um, in the United States today, there are over 5,000 colleges and universities, a lot. Yeah. But there are only seven, seven universities, uh, only seven, where a student can go and study human rights. So, yeah. of course, I am honored to be at one of those seven. Yeah. But in the, big, in the big picture of human rights education in the United States, it's disgraceful. Um, in our program today, uh, we have about uh, 5,000 students at our, at our university, undergraduates. Yeah. And we have almost, almost uh, 300 students there to study human rights. Uh, many of them, I would say the majority, are young women. Yeah. They want to go into human rights law. They want to be attorneys dealing with women's rights, children's rights, refugee rights. Uh, a lot of them are, are planning to go to law school, but uh, some of them uh, are want to be journalists. We have several who are uh, doctors and they are already members of Doctors Without Borders. Yeah. Um, they are uh they are uh, some are working in the world of nonprofits. Uh, they're, they're doing the full spectrum whatever they're interested in a lot of them are working in the field of psychology to deal with survivors of trauma and torture uh, and people who need a lot of help um, so we're very fortunate to have students just like yourselves yeah. who are passionate uh, about human rights. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Rick, uh, I just want to ask you about uh, the mood in America today is shifting towards more radicalism or what? And how can we stop the uh, injustice against the black people or people of different colors in America? How can we stop it? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, these are good questions. 
I, I would say this, the, the first question you asked, the mood in America today. How is the mood? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say this is the most dangerous mood in America I have seen in the country um, in my lifetime. It's, it's even uh, worse than all of the violence in the 1960s uh, for this reason. There is, uh, there used to be in America until very recently, politically, a willingness of the two sides, the Democrats and the Republicans, to compromise. That does not exist in America anymore today. Mm -hmm. uh, the Republican Party today is a party of extremists. It's not a mainstream party anymore. Yeah. It is dominated yeah. by extremists um, who are not committed to working with the Democrats and who sadly are not even committed to the truth. Uh, they are using technology mm -hmm. of social media to spew these un unbelievable conspiracy theories yeah. Um, it, it's, it's frightening, uh, the, the mentality of half the country that calls themselves Republicans. It's frightening. Uh, and with two elections coming up, it's, it does not bode well, in my opinion. I hear myself say this, I'm sorry to say it, but that's really where we're at today. Uh, the, the issue of race relations uh, in the United States we have not just violence against African Americans, but you may see a lot of news about hate crimes committed against Asian Americans yeah. as well. So if your students are interested, the main organization in the United States that monitors hate crimes, yeah. this is their website. The Southern Poverty Law Center splc.org and your students could look at that and, and realize the level of hate groups across the United States. Uh, there's over 800 different hate groups, yeah. whether they are anti-black, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim, uh, anti-women, and they're just whatever. It's just uh, this explosion of hate uh, on these yeah. issues of social justice in the United States today. It's a very disturbing time in this country, very disturbing. I think, you know, our times, you know, were better than this time today. Our times in 2010, 11, 12, I think, you know, they were better than today. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. I think times, when I was in America at SMU, were bitter than these days, right? Yes, yeah. they were much better. Yeah, much better, much better. Here by a student's track, uh, my name is Jehan Nassar. I will read some of their messages to you. They are happy with the meeting. Sure. I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Isam for the meeting and uh, Professor Rick for accepting the invitation. I have no question. The meeting, uh, uh, the meeting was very interesting, very useful, and uh, I feel very sorry about the racial discrimination that happened. I hope that equality and love will prevail without discrimination between black and white. Very good words. Uh, and another student, thank you for being with us, Professor Rick. My name is Ala Nafez Speer. And uh, other students, you know, thank you very much for the, um, this amazing meeting. Iman Iyad Ashur, you know, my student, thank you a lot for being with us. Thank you a lot for uh, uh, these, you know, important words. Let us see Asil al Madhun. Will America witness, this is a, a hard question, will America witness a revolution against racism? like what we saw when George Floyd was murdered, to change the racist reality in the country. The floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh -huh, yeah.
Okay, Rick. I think we have to see what the results of the two elections coming up in the next three years. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if the Republicans, uh, if they win the White House yeah. in 2024 mm -hmm. and America becomes more extremist, then uh, I do believe we will see thousands of people in the streets like we saw last year after the George Floyd killing. Yeah. I think it's possible. Uh, if the Democrats keep the White House in 2024, um, I think that that will probably limit the amount of street protest against um, against this against this violence. So uh, it's possible. The answer to that question is it's possible, depending upon who wins the elections in 2022 and 2024. Well, uh, Rick, thank you. What what do you think, you know, about the upcoming elections, you know, and what do you expect? Who will win? About, you know, you are there and you know the current situation and you know the mood. Who will win the next elections? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to say because I don't know who the Republican nominee will be in 2024. Mm -hmm. If Donald Trump if Trump runs again, mm -hmm. I am sure that he will lose. Yeah. Uh, because so many, so many millions of Americans d despise who he is and what he represents. Yeah. But if Trump is not the nominee and it's another Republican, I think that Republican, depending upon who it is, it could they could have a chance at winning the White House. A lot of them, Joe Biden is already 78 years old. Yeah, yes. So while, while Democrats may like Biden, uh, I think most Democrats want a younger person in the White House. Yeah. Uh, so, I, and Biden, I don't know if Biden's going to run. If he runs, uh, he could win. It's, it's so up in the air at this point. It's so uncertain. Mm -hmm. uh, it just depends on who the Republican nominee is. Yes, yes, yes. Another student, the, most of my students, thank you for this beautiful lecture. And, and here, Hanan Ayash, actually, I don't have any question. I want to thank you, Dr. Rick, for this meeting. Uh, any question, my students, you know, for Professor Rick? Okay, here, uh, Munira Abu Musa. Okay, thank you, Professor Rick, about this meeting. Really, you enrich our mind. Hope you, we see you in other meeting. Uh, well, Professor Rick is a great man, a great human being, uh, and I was fortunate to meet him in person and spend days and days, you know, speaking about different issues. We have amazing 12 years of strong friendship and still going strong forever, inshallah. Actually, I want to thank you, all my students. Thank you, Professor Rick. We are happy that you are with us today. Let us see here another question. Uh, thank you. This is Norhan Iyad. Thank you, Mr. Rick, for this awesome meeting. My name is Nurhan Ayad. As, as I said, Rick, most uh, all my students are females, and they are happy, you know, having you here. And uh, thank you, Professor Rick. This is from Siro Najjar. I hope there will be other lectures. Uh, I will invite him definitely about different issues. Inshallah, inshallah. Any question, my students? Okay, any concluding note, uh, if you want to speak, final note to my students, Professor Rick? Well, yeah, yes, again, of course, I, I thank you for this opportunity. I want to, uh, I want to just say to your students, yeah, um, that you are not forgotten. Uh, certainly not in our human rights programs and by yeah. people in the human rights community in the United States. Yeah. You are not forgotten. Uh, I have been, I, Isam knows, I have been yeah. uh, in Gaza 
uh, and I I look forward to the professor, time where Rick, I can... Professor Rick, sorry, please tell them, you know, the final note about your experience in Gaza. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I've, I was fortunate to come to Gaza in January of 1993. Yeah. Uh, I was in Jabalia. Uh, it's, it's among the most amazing uh, experiences I've ever had in my life. Yeah. It was very difficult, of course, to see the living conditions and uh, the restrictions of life uh, that were imposed upon people there. Uh, it was very painful, but uh, it, it helped me uh, every day, truthfully, every day I think about people there, I think about you, I'm blessed to know Professor Shihada, so I have a face and a voice uh, in Gaza. I talk to my students about it all the time. Uh, I talk to audiences uh, everywhere I go about it. So I just want to tell you as students, um, you won't be students forever. Uh, you're going to get on with your life and I, I just want you to know that uh, whatever you do in your life, whatever you do, I would argue that your real job is to make the world better through human rights and the struggle for human dignity. That's your job. That's also my job. Yeah. That's the job. It should be the job of everybody in this world yeah. to yeah. work for the protection defense of human rights for everybody. So I, I'm just honored that I could chat with you and thank you all, truly, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Professor Rick, for being with us. And it will be the beginning for more lectures in the future. I will arrange with you. I look forward to it. And I am, you know, I look forward to, and my students, you know, like to have you again and again and please uh, send my greetings to all my colleagues at SMU and to everybody. I will. <laughs> and tell them about your experience, you know, having, uh, you know, seeing me today and seeing my student. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Isam. Thank you. Thank Love you. Love you. Miss you. Yeah, I miss you too. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to all. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And thank you to you from my students too. Here is Wafa Safi. Thank you for the amazing lecture. Professor Rick, my name is Wafa Safi. We will have more lectures with you, Professor Rick. And thank you a lot and have a nice day. Thank you a lot. You, you. you too. Be safe. Well, thank you. Thank you. I will. I will try my best. Thank you. Thank you.